Amen? Turn your Bibles. Judges chapter 18. Can you believe it? Judges 18 in our verse-by-verse study in the book of Judges. Hmm. Let's pray. Father, you are such an easy God to love, and we are enamored by your goodness and your kindness and your compassion and your long-suffering, your patience for us. And so tonight, God, we uh, just want the world to know that we are dedicated to you. We're devoted to you. We adore you. And our uh, heart longs for the day when we see you face to face. And in the meantime, God, uh, you exhort us in your word to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of, uh, of the word. So that's what we are doing tonight, God. We are studying to show ourselves approved workmen and work women who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God, thank you for uh, this story from 3,200 years ago and how it impacts uh, and can be applied to what we are living today in uh, August of 2021. Lord, what sweet people you have brought here tonight, I pray that their hearts would be open, that they'd hear your voice, and that they would apply what they hear. In the matchless name of our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Judges chapter uh, 18. Let's start this way. Look at the person next to you and say, not every opportunity is an opportunity from God. Not every opportunity is an opportunity from God. Obviously, on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, I'm encouraging you, you always bring your Bible, you always bring a notepad, a journal, something to write on, pen, pencil, crayon, something to write with. So that should be the first thing that you write down for tonight. Not every opportunity is an opportunity from God might want to add to that that sometimes, sometimes it's just the devil baiting the trap that you and I have revealed to him that we would fall for. Do you realize that the devil studies you? He never sleeps. He's studying you right now. He's saying, okay, are these people here just to go through the motions or are they here to do business, serious business? in uh, growing closer to me. Um, So the devil loves to bait the trap because we give a tell. You know what a tell is? Um, We, something that we give away when something else is going to happen. Like if you're a gambler, I know that none of you gamble, Um, but uh, you know, tip your hat or pull your glasses down or uh, look down to the left or look down to the right, something, there's a tell. Well, we all have a tell when it comes to our sin. And never forget this, never forget this. Free cheese is always available in all mouse traps, or at least they appear to what? They appear to be free until what? The hammer comes down, right? And crushes the neck of the poor little unsuspecting mousey. Keep that in mind as I share this illustration. In New York, late night uh, power surge uh, enables the door of a Chinese restaurant to uh, automatically open. So cue the two drunk girls walking by the business. They just so happen to notice this and choose to see if this is an opportunity and they enter the business. As they are walking around the kitchen, they decide to, uh, to make some food. That's what you do when you're drunk, right? So they, so they go to the freezer. They grab a bag of all things, a bag of dumplings, a bag of dumplings, and they try to cook them in cold water. <laughs> do I need to mention again that they were drunk? So they finally leave the restaurant thinking that no one will ever know until the surveillance video shows up the next day on Facebook, right? Hmm. 
<laughs> showing them in all their drunken splendor, their, their little potty mouths and everything that they were thinking about. There's your article. Now, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm just thankful that I haven't touched alcohol since I got saved in uh, 1989. But, but I remember before, you guys know my story, before that I was quite the partier and I can't remember if I made good decisions or not when I was drunk. Can you guys, I mean, remember back in those days? No, I didn't make good decisions. You know, it was way, be <laughs> way back before I got saved. You know, we were all loaded and we went to, <laughs> we were all, went to, to get Chinese takeout food. Do you remember that? Did you guys ever do that? Did you, what did you get the munchies? What did you get the munchies for? Tacos, okay? Terry? Hardies. What? Hardies. 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 I want to ask the rest of you because you guys are all the goody two-shoes. I can see your little halos gl glistening from here. So, so when we were all loaded, we go and get Chinese takeout food. And I, I never forgot eating my first fortune cookie because it left a taste of paper in my mouth. <laughs> you get it? I didn't know it was a fortune cookie. And I mean the, uh, I mean the paper. Is, again... Not wise decisions when you're, when you're wasted. Here's the point. I have a point. I have a point. These, these two little dumpling stealers were doing what was what? Right in their own eyes and thought there would be no consequences. And in a similar way, people today, even religious people, make decisions that are right in their own eyes but definitely wrong in whose eyes? In God's eyes, in God's eyes. And um, we're going to see that lived out tonight in our study in Judges 18. So I love how we teach around here. We just take a book of the Bible. Wednesday nights, we go through the Old Testament. Sunday mornings, we go through, uh, we go through the New Testament. And it is just such a great way to learn the Bible. Hey, we're in chapter 18. Do you remember when we started Judges? It wasn't all that long ago. It wasn't all that long ago, but we're in the home stretch in our study, the book of Judges. And for the most part, the involvement of the, well, extra credit, how many judges have we uh, studied their lives up to this point? Anybody know? Jen? Somebody give that girl a bag of Skittles, right? Good job. It is 12. But you all knew that, right? Yes. Jen just rescued you all, right? 12, maybe 13, depends how you count. But, uh, but these final chapters, we've talked about this, and we mentioned it when we got to chapter 17. Uh, these final chapters, they're not in chronological order. And they're not necessarily to advance the story per se, but to reveal the depth of apostasy that Israel has sunk to at this phase in their life. And you'll remember in chapter 17, you can just look there in your Bible. Look at verse 6. We read this, in those days there was what? No king, right? There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what? What was right in his own eyes. They haven't forgotten the God of Israel, but they have formed him into their own image instead of allowing him to transform them into his. Do you ever see that in the church today? They pick and choose. They have some celestial God. Take a little bit out of here, a little bit out of here, but they don't worship the God of the Bible. Hmm. We saw that, uh, that lived out, that everybody's doing what was right in their own eyes, when we were introduced in chapter 17 to a man named... Anybody remember? Micah. Micah, sitting in the third row tonight, right? Different Micah, right? Um, this man named Micah, whose mommy paid to purchase him what? Carved and molded images, obviously something that was forbidden, right? By Levitical, by Levitical law. But they aren't following the law. They are following themselves, doing what is right in their in their own eyes. And like many people today, uh, Micah has convinced himself that it is God who is blessing him in, uh, in what we know, the Scriptures teach, is blasphemous. First and second commandment, right? No other gods before me shall not make any what? Any graven image, right? Or not have any, 
any, uh, any idol. So it's blasphemous. And to add insult to injury, this Micah uh, has even gone to the extent of doing what? What did he build in his little house there? He built a shrine to these images, and then he did what? He hired a... Yeah, Renner Free. Yeah, yeah. He hired a wayward, uh, a wayward Levite to be his own little personal priest, which, uh, little newsflash here, that's not going to last very long because these Renner Pastor types are only after the money and the bigger audience, and, and they show very, they show very little loyalty. And, and tonight, Micah is going to learn the principle of easy come. Easy come, easy go. All right. Chapter 18, look at, uh, look at verse 1. And um, we are going to make it through all 30 verses tonight, so I hope you packed. I yeah, hope you brought some, some Chinese takeout, right? Brought, brought some, no, we'll, we'll still be done on time. And I'm going to try not to cut into uh, to your uh, discussion time. I said Try. I said, try. Okay. Verse 1, in those days, there was no what? King in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. And until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not, what? Fallen to them. Story switches uh, away from Micah. Do you remember what tribe he was from? Starts with an E, ends in... Ephraim, right? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Happy Easter of Ephraim. Uh, and this is going to switch to another group, another group uh, from the tribe of Dan. Now, can you think of anybody else that we have studied recently who is also from the tribe of Dan? Just here. This, will give, this is your hint. He looked a lot like me, right? Yeah. Samson, yeah. Samson. So, uh, so like Samson, as we will see, this is a very dysfunctional group of people. Now, like all the tribes of Israel, uh, especially those not following the Lord, they're in a little bit of a pickle. They're always under attack from the west by who? Anybody remember? The Philistines, exactly. The Philistines, and from the east by the, you remember who the other arch enemies were? Anybody? Starts with an A. That was close. And more rights. Very good. Okay, Skittles for you two as well, Monica. Well done. Well played. Well played. The tribe of Judah is to the south, and these guys are going to head north. They're going to end up heading, heading north. Now, uh, God has given them this allotment of land. Let me, uh, well, I'll wait. It's coming up. Given them an, an allotment of, uh, of land where they were already at, along with the promise that they must, what were, what were the tribe's responsibility to do? They were the ones that needed to drive them out, right? Drive their enemies out. But who was going to fight their battle for them? Yeah, the Lord. The Lord was going to fight their battle for them. Well, they become tired in the fight against the bad guys, so they basically surrender. They choose to flee instead of fighting the enemy. Can anybody say Afghanistan? No, I won't say it out loud. All right. Now, don't miss this. The text says the Danites were seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in, for until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. So immediately, pulling on the heartstrings there a little bit, you're thinking, oh, these poor little Danites, you know, they got left out of the divvying up of the land. And uh, now these unfairly treated peoples are, are forced to seek out their own land. So we should feel sorry for them, right? Not so fast, Squiggy, right? Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 19. Joshua 19, Squiggy. How do you like that? <laughs> Bet you nobody's ever called you Squiggy before, huh? What was that from? Was that Happy Days? No. Laverne and Shirley, there was a squiggy. I knew there was a squiggy in there somewhere. <laughs> Joshua chapter 19, look at, uh, look at verse 40. It says, The seventh lot came out for the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families. 
territory, the inheritance was Zorah, Eshtaol, Ir Shemesh, Sha'al bin, you don't know how to pronounce it either, uh, Ajalon, Jephla, Elon Musk, no, it's not Elon Musk, uh, Timna, Ekron, Elteka, uh, Givathon, Baalath, Jehud, Beni, Barak, Gath, Ramon, come on, uh, uh, me, Jarkon, it sounds like people from like a Star Wars movie or something, like <laughs> me, Jarkon, uh, and Rekon with a region near Joppa, I got that one, <laughs> the region near, uh, near Joppa, and the board of the children of Dan went beyond these because the children of Dan went up to fight against uh, Leshem and took it, and they struck it with the edge of the sword. Uh, took possession of it and dwelt in it. They called the Shem Dan, after the name of Dan, their father. This is the inheritance of the tribe, of the children of Dan, according to their families, these cities with their villages. So God has done what? Given them. He's given them their land. Their job was to do what? Drive out, right? Drive out the Philistines that God had promised he would fight their battle. The problem is fighting is hard. Look at the person next to you and say, fighting is hard. Fighting is hard. Fighting is hard, and it took effort. So they surrender the land given to them by God to go in search of something what? Easier. Easier. Here's the application. Many Christians today have the same mentality, don't they? They've convinced themselves that Christianity is to be like life on a cruise ship, but the Bible says it's more like life on what? A battleship, right? A, a battleship. So look at verse 2. So, so the children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory. See, they have territory. Their territory, men of valor mighty men of valor from Zorah and Eshtaol to spy out the land and to search it. They said to them, go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim, right, to the house of Micah and lodged there. These are mighty men of valor, probably not named Squiggy, okay? You would be a mighty man of valor, right? He's your kid. Wouldn't he be a mighty man of valor? Come on, wouldn't he be a mighty man of valor? Yeah. I don't think they're convinced. <laughs> I am, though. I am. Mighty man of valor. Soldiers. And we're going to see, these are covert ops guys, kind of like SEAL Team 6. Uh, and where do they end up? Coincidentally, at Micah's house, who apparently is a popular and wealthy dude in the region. So they pop in and he shows them hospitality. And I don't think that Micah's house was the only house in Ephraim. And I don't think this is an accident. Out of all the places for them to land, they end up where? At Micah's condo, right? They, make a, they end up at Micah's condo. And I think this was coordinated, but I don't think it was coordinated by God. I think it's coordinated by the devil. And the Bible exhorts us to test what? Test the spirits, exactly. Test the spirits. Because I heard somebody say this before. Can you remind me when you heard this before? Not every opportunity is an opportunity that God places on your plate, right? Hmm. Not every opportunity is an opportunity for your good. Uh, often it's from the devil, and it's bad. Bad. It's very, very bad. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. While they were at the house of Micah. They recognized the voice of the young Levite. They turned aside and said to him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What do you have here? And they recognize his accent, possibly, we don't know, uh, identifying his speech as a, as a Levite. Now, keep in mind, this poser priest was unnamed. Remember in the last chapter? He was unnamed. And he still is here in chapter 18, but those of you that have done your homework, how many of you have read ahead? Are you, sure? you guys are killing me. Okay. This is your homework. Always read ahead what we're going to be studying. So on Sunday, read ahead, Revelation 9. If you've got kids under six, 
read them to it before you go to bed. No, don't read your kids, Revelation uh, 9, before they go to bed, because you're going to be up all night, because they're going to, well, they'll be in your bed. They'll end up, because it's kind of some scary stuff, crazy stuff that's going on. But please, 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 that's, my responsibility is prepare to teach you. Your responsibility is to prepare to be taught. So just do your devotions on Wednesday morning, if you have to wait that long, on what we're going to be going through on Wednesday nights, and same thing on Sunday mornings, okay? So, uh, look at, let us move on. Oh, well, we'll find out at the end of this chapter, those of you that have read ahead, you already, do you already know? Did you read ahead? Maybe. Okay. I'll take a maybe. But you probably did. You probably already know that the guy has, the guy does have a name and it's going to surprise you. Look at the person next to you and go, a surprise? <laughs> Everybody plays a surprise. Come on. You can have a little fun studying the Bible. Look at verse 4. He said to them, okay, this is the Levite here. Uh, As I was hitchhiking across the country in the summer of 69. No, he doesn't say that. But he says, thus and, and so Micah did for me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. Why does that not make any sense? There weren't supposed to be any personal priests. If you were a Levite, what were you doing? You were following your lot when it came up for you to serve where? In the tabernacle, of course, of course. So this guy's a rogue priest. We've talked about that in weeks past. So the guy explains that he is Micah's personal pastor and priest. Look at verse 5. So they said to him, please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we go or will be prosperous. And, and verse 6, and the priest said to them, well, give me a couple hours and I'll go talk to the Lord. And No, he doesn't say that. He says, go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. Notice that there is no inquiry of the Lord. The poser just rattles off some feel-good message that, uh, that they will go in peace and that the Lord is with them. You know, we live, don't, isn't this true? We live in an age where what most professing Christians call prayer isn't really prayer at all. We mouth some words to God, maybe even throwing in some up-to-date Christianese, but there's no dialogue. There's no dialogue. There's no conversation with the Lord. You know, I'm the guy, always fine and it is written. Always look for an it is written or a thus saith the Lord when you are making your decisions. When we pray, we should always have Bible in hand because that's the only way to verify if something might be of the Lord or maybe it's just a little heartburn, you know, from the anchovy pizza we had the night before. How many of you ever made a mistake in saying, I think the Lord is calling me to this and you found out later, it definitely wasn't the Lord? Raise your hands. The rest of you just lied in church. I can't believe you. Okay, we've all been there. If you're asking questions of somebody, if you're trying to get counsel from someone and they don't give you any scripture, how can you believe it's from the Lord? Hmm. Look at verse 7. How many men are involved here? Five, right? So the five men departed and they went to Laish. Now, Laish... I was just talking to some friends earlier, and they're going, man, when is your next Israel trip? And I said, I don't know. You know, Israel's closed. It's shut down as tight as any nation on the planet. And uh, it bothers me because we usually go to Israel every couple of years because when I take people to Israel, uh, you come back changed. Isn't that true? You come back cha changed. You never read your Bible the same. You know, you, are, you guys right now are thinking in your minds, Laish, I kind of know. I can look on the map, and I can kind of know where that is. It's above the Sea of Galilee, almost all the way to Lebanon. And we've been there. We were, all, we were at the Syrian border. We were 75 yards. Nobody ever does this. Uh, we were 75 yards from the Syrian border. And this is when ISIS, you can see the black flags, you know, way down off in the distance. Um, and we went to, uh, to a bombed-out uh, headquarters of the Syrian army, isn't it? Just reminiscing. I want to go to Israel. So anyway, uh, 
you should know, you should know the geography, at least the basic geography of, of Israel. So I put it up there on a map. So they go about 60 miles, 70 miles north to Laish, and it's, uh, it's basically due north of the Sea of Galilee, like I said, almost to the Syrian border. So this was, it was quite a journey. And they saw the people who were there, how they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. Is that underlining your Bibles? Quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians, and they had no ties with anyone. So these, uh, these five special ops guys, they presume that the, that the battle is going to be like taking candy from uh, a baby because it doesn't appear that they have a military and they don't seem to have anyone who will uh, come to their rescue. And, and just a sidebar, raise your hand if you're a mom. Raise your hand if you're a mom. Okay, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you're a dad. Okay, okay. Um, have you ever tried to take candy from a baby? <laughs> it's anything but easy, isn't it? Yeah, so I don't know what those things are thinking about. Look at verse 8. Then the spies came back to their brethren at Zorah and Eshtaol and their brethren and said to them, hey, what's your report? So they said, arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and indeed it is very good. Would you do nothing? Do you hesitate to go and enter to possess a land? When you go, you will come to a secure people in a large land, and here it is, underline this in your Bibles, for God has given it into your hands a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. The spies say, taking this land is going to be what? Easy peasy. It's, it's ours for the taking. Saddle up your donkeys and your horses. Let's get her done. It's basically what they're thinking. And before we move on, here's, uh, here's Greg Blanc's uh, pet peeve number 206. Um, God never told them to go north. God never told them to go north, and God never told them to go murder a bunch of innocent people. So just be careful about claiming that God has told you to do something when there's no biblical support that, uh, that he's done that. Look at verse 11. Verse 11. And 600, 600 men of the family of the Danites went up from there, from Zorah and Eshtahol, armed with weapons of war. Then they went up and encamped at Kirjath Jerim in Judah. Therefore, they call the place uh, Mahane Dan to this day. And there it is, west of Kirjath Jerim. And they passed from there to the mountains of Ephraim and came to the house of who? Micah. Then the five of them who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, Do you not know, uh, or do you know, that there are in these houses an ephod, household idols, a carved image, and a molded image. Now, therefore, consider what you should do. You know, my translation is to consider what you should do. Consider what you should steal. That's what they're thinking right here. We're going to steal some stuff. Look at verse 15. And they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite man, to the house of Micah, and greeted him. The 600 men, armed with weapons of war, who were of the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. Then the five men who had gone to spot the land went up, entering there. They took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. The priest stood at the entrance of the gate with the 600 men who were armed with the weapons of war. Now, um, in the last chapter... We were told that there was just one carved image and one carved, what? Or one molded image. But as people have always been inclined to do, if two idols are good, more idols, more better, right? More better. So it appears that Micah and his phony baloney um, idol-worshipping priest have added to their shrine a bunch more idols. And if it was an idol of a goat, then it might have been a, a Billy idol. Get it? Uh, Got to look at the picture. All right, I know. I just did that for the ex-headbangers. Okay, moving on. Verse 18. 
When these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, a molded image, the priest said to them, what's up with that? What are you doing, right? So the rent priest questions what they're doing and is basically defending Micah's property, which is what? The right thing. That's the right thing to do. But how long? How long will he continue to do the right thing? Look at verse 19. And they said to him, be quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and uh, come with us. Uh, be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest of the household of one man or that you be a priest of the tribe and a family in Israel? These are not nice men. These are not nice men. The guy simply says, uh, this stuff uh, doesn't belong to you. And they respond with what? Shut your pie hole, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and get in the van. Shut your pie hole and get in the van, you know. Okay, you're not going to be able to stop us. Get on the wagon. You're coming with us. Look at verse 20. So the priest's uh, heart was glad <laughs> and took the ephod and the household idols and the carved image and took his uh, place among the people. Bad company corrupts what? Good character. Yep. Hmm. Why is he glad? Why is he glad? He woke up that morning. Remember we talked about this in the beginning of chapter 17. He woke up that morning making how much a year? Ten shekels, right? Ten shekels a year and serving one man. And now he thinks, I'll be making a lot more shekels and serving a whole tribe. Count me in. Count me in. Now, do you understand what's going on here? They think this priest is legit and that if they just have their own religious leader, God will prosper them in, uh, in battle and beyond. So they steal him away from Micah and the poser priest thinks he's getting a promotion, especially knowing that the tribe of Dan, right now it has oceanfront property. Right? I mean, if you look on your maps... Dan has oceanfront property and probably has good surf, right? So he's thinking, shrimp on the barbie, right? Shrimp on the barbie, not the doll, the barbecue, right? So he's going, hey, this is going to be a good deal. Um, those of you that know me, I, I have no respect for a sellout. Do you, have a, do you have respect for a sellout? I don't have any respect for a sellout, and that's what this guy is. Um, so much for his allegiance to Micah, which he shouldn't have been aligned with to begin with, but uh, now he is putting his ability up for sale to the highest bidder, and this guy had no business. He had no authority to be anybody's priest. He's rogue. He's a runaway. Look at verse 21. And they turned and departed. And put the little ones, the livestock uh, and the goods in front of them. Verse 22. When they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they called out to the children of Dan. So they turned around and said to Micah, what ails you, bro? Right? What ails you that, uh, that you have gathered such a company? And... Uh, in the English translation, we probably miss exactly what the Danites are, uh, are saying here. They are, they are mockingly saying, what's your problem? What's your problem? When they know exactly what their problem is, they want their stolen items back. And so, uh, so what does Micah say? You've taken away my gods, which I have made. <laughs> Do you underline? Which I have made. Uh, and the priest, and you have gone away. That's about the truest statement Micah has said. You have taken away my gods, which I have made. What kind of God is it if it can be made by a man? I've mentioned this before. If you could pick up your God and stick him underneath your arm and walk away with it, You've got the wrong God. Isn't it great that we serve the omnipotent, the omniscient God? Hmm. <sighs> You've taken away my gods, which I have made, and the priests, and you have gone uh, away. Now, what more do I have? How can you say to me, what ails you? 
I should have probably done it in more of a sniveling tone. He's whimpering right here. You, you stole my gods, right? You stole my like a pouty lip. I don't have one of those, so uh, yeah, we all do. It's genetic, right? Everybody in Adam's family, right? As a pouty lip hanging down, sad eyes. Uh, it is pathetic to see a man act like a child. You ever seen that? Seen a, a full-grown man acting like a little boy? I don't know how you ladies don't laugh at us when we do that, when we pull that kind of stuff. Do you? Okay. <laughs> well, you have every right to. You have every right to. If we're, uh, if we're a full-grown man and we're acting like a child, it's just like, ladies, you, you just need to give us a signal. Well, you ladies get together and give us the signal. Make up a signal so that we know. Just, just go like this or something, or just so that we know that we're acting like a child, because it's not behooving a man of God to act like a child. So I'm thinking that these mighty men of valor are, uh, are no one to mess with, but Micah still does. Micah still does. And how will they respond to, uh, to Micah's answer of, You've taken away my gods and my priest, right? My little, my little, little priest. And look at verse 25. And the children of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry men uh, will fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Uh, we're going to find out in a few verses that these guys are just a bunch of murdering thugs. And what they're saying here is... is uh, is listen here, old timer, put a cork in it, because if you push this matter, we are going to put you on an immediate eight-pound weight loss program by separating your head from your shoulder. That's about what the average melon weighs. Yours probably weighs more because you've got so many brains in there, right? <laughs> You're a good man, Charlie Brown, right? Look at verse 26. Verse 26. Then the children of Dan went their way, and when... Uh, Micah saw that they were too strong for him. He turned and went back to his house. Now is your opportunity. Look at the person next to you. Everybody plays and say, easy come, easy go. Easy come, easy go. One moment, doesn't he, doesn't he think like he's on top of the world? One moment he thinks he's on top of the world, claiming he has God's blessing. He's got his own little idols. He's got his own little shrine. His own little priest, right? Hmm. And in a moment, in a day, in one conversation, he is stripped of what he had put all his hope in. Now, normally, this would be a throwaway verse, just one that's skimmed over without considering why the Holy Spirit put it there. But there's a principle. There's a principle that we just better not miss False gods and false idols never last. They never last. They can't last. Why? Because they're false. false. <laughs> because they're false. Eventually, they will abandon you. So wisdom says, put your hope in the one who promises to what? Never, never leave us or forsake us. Verse 27. So they took the things Micah had made and the priest who had belonged to him, and they went where? To Laish. They went to Laish, to a people quiet and secure, and they struck them with the edge of the sword, and they burned the city with fire. Verse 28, there was no deliverer because it was far from Sodom, and they had no ties with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rahab. So they rebuilt the city and they dwelt there. Here's a couple of things to be thinking through. It appears that the people were from Laish. They were most likely Sidonians. They weren't Canaanites. So there was no mandate from God to destroy them. Apparently, they were a peaceful people. They were probably farmers. They weren't fighters. They were innocent and they were defenseless, and the Danites easily killed them. It's a sad commentary on people who claimed to be serving the Lord. Now, in verse 28, look at verse 28. The text says that the people of Laish had no deliverer 
because they had moved far away from the people of Sidon. Now, uh, here's the second principle for us Christians tonight. When you separate, when you separate yourselves from the structure of safety the Lord has given you, expect to be pummeled. We see so many people blow off the protective covering of staying connected to a local body of believers. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren as is the manner of some, right? This is the manner of some. Hmm. When bar- who, are bar- who are the barbecuers? Who, who, who are the barbecuers? A couple of you? Okay. Notice those hands so that you'll be able to just coincidentally be driving past their house and stop in and say hello when you smell the barbecue going, right? Oh, I just happened to be in the neighborhood. Oh, stay for a steak? Love to, right? <laughs> Love to. But those of you that barbecue on a regular basis or who have ever seen a barbecue, when hot coals roll off the pile, what happens? What happens to the one briquette that rolls away from the other briquettes? It cools down quickly and eventually does what? Goes out, goes out completely. So I always tell people, you know somebody right now who's out of fellowship, just give them a call. Just encourage them. You know, if they go to church here, encourage them to come back here. If they, if they go to church somewhere else, encourage them to get back. Get back in fellowship. A couple more verses we'll wrap up for tonight. Verse 29. And they called the name of that city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born to Israel. However, the name of the city formerly was Laish. Do you guys that went on the last Israel trip, do you remember when I took you to the city of Dan up north? Pretty cool up there, right? Now, isn't that what we just read in, uh, in Joshua, when we started out earlier, Joshua 19? Verse 47, and the border of the children of Dan went beyond these because the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it. And they struck it with the edge of the sword, took possession of it and dwelt in it. And what did they do it? They called Leshem Dan after the name of their father. So now they have two regions, right? It's not good. Um, God had already given them the true land of Dan on the coast, on the Mediterranean, but now they choose to go to a new place but call themselves by the same name, right? Look at verse 30. Then the children of Dan, then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image and Jonathan, din, 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 you knew that, right? Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests of the tribe of Dan until the day of captivity of the land. Now, I mentioned earlier that we were going to find out uh, that this rogue Rena priest had a name. What's his name? Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Manasseh. At least it reads Manasseh in the New King James. What are some of your other, but what do you have? Yeah, what, are you, what translation are you reading? NIV? NIV? It says Moses. Okay. What else do you have? New Living, New American Standard. What do you got? What do you have? And what does it say? Does it say Moses or does it says Manassas? Anybody else? Okay. Some translations say Manassas. Some say Moses. Um, but in the Septuagint and uh, the Latin Vulgate, they aren't based on the Masoretic texts, Right? They don't have Manasseh written there. They have Moses there, leaving the deduction that this is the grandson of Moses. This reveals also, remember, we're talking about this is a flashback. We're not going in chronological order because we know the time of the judges spans about 400 years. Um, So this tells us that this event that we're reading about happens within the first hundred years of Israel entering into the promised land. Now, Moses, do you get that? Moses, the lawgiver, the lawgiver, the mighty man of God, and here, his worthless grandson doing what is right in his own eyes. His lineage, I'm just, I'm just, don't take anything for granted. 
your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, you never stop investing the Word of God in them. Never, 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 never. Verse 31, last verse for tonight. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he had made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Did we go to Shiloh on this trip? We didn't go to Shiloh, I don't think. I don't think so. Um, you can't always get. You can't, uh, when you do an Israel trip, you can't always go uh, to Shiloh because um, it's in Palestinian territory. It's in the West Bank. And uh, sometimes we can get in, sometimes we can't. It wasn't even on our list this time because we couldn't squeeze everything in. But, uh, but I like to go because it's where the original tabernacle was before, uh, and it was, it was the capital of uh, Israel before Jerusalem was. So again, verse 31, so they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he had made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh or Shiloh. Um, I have learned this, sin never stays small. Sin never stays small. Look how the sin of idolatry snowballs. First, it's just one man and his family with their runaway rogue priest worshiping idols. Now it's an entire tribe. And as we discussed in our first king study, after the fall of the United Kingdom, 10 of the 12 tribes went north under the leadership of who? Do you remember? Starts with a G, I mean a J, Jeroboam. Jeroboam, Jeroboam. And instead of worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem, Jeroboam built altars where? One in, well, turn your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 12. Always want you to be cross-referencing this. Write down the cross-reference in your Bibles when you get back to it in, uh, in Judges. 1 Kings chapter 12. Verse 28, 29. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, this is King Jeroboam, and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And they set one up at Bethel and then one at Dan. We did go to Dan, right? Yeah, I remember we went to Dan, and uh, it's just heartbreaking. Sin is contagious, and left unchecked, it spreads without restraint. And without restraint it is an understatement to, uh, to see what we're going to read through when we get to chapter 19. So you have to come back, find out, or you can just read ahead and find out. <laughs> And find out uh, on your own. All right. Here we go. Discussion questions for tonight. Discussion questions for tonight. You teach us so much through our study in the Old Testament on Wednesday nights. And uh, even though this happened, this is over 3,000 years ago, Lord, there's definitely principles that are applicable for today. Number one, Lord, um, help us to be satisfied and content with the land the promised land that you had offered, that you have offered to, uh, to our, us and, and not do what's right in our own eyes and go and seek out some other land. Um, and Lord, help us to be loyal. Uh, help us not to be like Micah in this case uh, or like Jonathan in this case who, uh, who just jumped ship when he was threatened. And God, um, help us to remember that not every opportunity is an opportunity from the Lord Help us to test the spirits to make sure that they're of, they're of you. Um, Lord, help us to not be that, uh, that one coal, that one briquette that, that uh, falls to the side. Help us to stay um, within all the uh, other um, burning coals so that we can stay hot, remain hot, 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 um, allowing iron to sharpen iron and that we can stir one another on towards uh, love and, uh, and good works. God, we pray that our discussion time would be fruitful and that you would change our hearts to be like yours. 
We pray this, Lord, um, as humbly as possible in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.